<laughs> okay. Now we had a break and we get back in our study to this heart grab of a column. We'll actually do a review previously about obtaining the love of God. Why we should, why should we obtain it? And what effects, by the way, does it has on us? And this is basically what he's commenting on in this section. And in this section, by the way, let's start somewhere around the first paragraph. He said, whoever, huh, I guess that's what? Anybody. Whoever undertakes this should adopt the following method. He should recite the admonition. Now remember, he, he gave us, and I think they're in the back of your book. Remember the two prayers that he talked about? Mm -hmm. uh, one section is admonition, and the other section he refers to as entreaty, I believe. Yeah, I am an issue. First one is admonition, and then the next one is entreaty. Entreaty. Okay. So this is what he's talking about. <clears throat> so if you adopt this practice of saying these prayers, is what he's saying. He said he should recite the admonition while seated, after first prefacing it with whatever he chooses of the usual psalms or the like. In other words, you could read several psalms before you actually begin to say this one. He should then recite the entreaty standing and then bowing low until it's in. Now he talks about bowing. Uh, it's a certain way you bow, from the waist down, right? Like a dobbing? Yes. Well, the shuffling or dobbing is this, but bowing is all the way, you know, when you, you've been to the show, so you've seen mm -hmm. them bow in certain ways, like you're bowing before the Creator, bowing before the King. <clears throat> it goes on to say, uh, until it's in, he should then kneel and recite whatever supplication he wishes and follow them with the psalms that opens. This is Psalm 119.1. How blessed are those of upright way. And the entire group of psalms that bear the title, A Song of Ascents, and we discussed those. So everybody knows what the Song of Ascents are now, right? There's 15. 15 Songs of Ascent. Why are there 15 Songs of Ascent? 15 steps. 15 steps. Going up to the temple, right? If one chooses to recite other prayers or use any other order, he may do so. I merely suggest to you the most fitting way of going about it. The main thing, my brother, is, is to have purity of spirit when you recite these prayers. And that you concentrate on them properly, recite them and what follows them slowly, and not let your tongue get ahead of your heart. In other words, think about what you're saying. <clears throat> and remember that there's a Hebrew word that you should never forget. It's called kavana. <coughs> intent. Intent. And when you pray, you should pray with okay. intent. Intent of the heart, right? So don't let your mouth get ahead. Don't let it get ahead of your heart. For a little of a prayer with a heart's devotion is better than a lot recited rapidly <coughs> with a tongue without devotion. Your breath. If you look, by the way, in a Jewish prayer book, which I don't have one available, but if you look in the Elaine prayer, which is the, the ending prayer of, of the daily prayers. They're in the back of your knock, aren't they? No, I don't think so. Not the Elaine prayer. But there is a statement that says, May these words, may these words, and the intent of my heart be acceptable before you. So it's not just the words that you're asking God to do what? To accept. You're, you're asking Him to accept the proper intent in which they've been said too. Okay? So remember that. It's not just saying the words. It's kavana. It's the proper intent with which you say these words. Better than a lot recited rapidly with a tongue without devotion. A past one remark, do not offer uh, vivacious, not vivacious, vivacious praise 
empty because the heart is not in it. In other words, if you're going to praise God, and your heart's not in it, don't do what? Don't do it. Rather, let your heart be ever present when you pray, as David, peace be upon him, said, With all my heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Psalm 119 and verse 10. With all my heart I plead before you. 119.58. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. To Hillam 84.3. Other signs that a person loves God are joy and delight in God. May be exalted. And in knowledge of Him, longing for His favor, exalting in love of Him, attachment to His Torah, regard for those who fear Him, as it says, I am a friend to all who fear you. I'm a friend to all those that respect you. Uh, tell him 11963. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. To Hill 40 verse 17. And in the ways of your precepts I delight. That's in Tell him 1914. I have taken possession of your precepts, for they are my heart's delight. There are several different Hebrew words for delight. <laughs> No, you're thinking about the one in uh, the book Isaiah. of Isaiah. No, it's, it's uh, that's what I'm saying. If you read in Isaiah when he talks about delight, uh, there's two different words that are translated delight in that passage. So you got to figure out, was it, is it the same Hebrew word? And in the Isaiah passage, it's not the same Hebrew word. And then the last one he says, Yet I rejoice in Hashem, exalt in the God of my salvation, the God of my deliverance. Right? Now, that's Habakkuk, by the way, chapter 3, verse 18. Now, chapter 7, he begins, he says, The ways of those who love God may be exalted are too many to enumerate. I will mention only what occurs to me of them. These people know their God. They recognize what He expects of them, that He governs and guides them, provides for them, and that everything He allows them to engage in and choose in religious or secular matters is still bound by His rule and under his control. So if you want to know how to operate in business, it's his rules. Operate your business under his controls. By the way, operating your business under his rules and controls means you don't steal from people. <laughs> right? At least that's one thing that we get our attention. You don't steal from people. He goes on to say, they are firm in their conviction that all their affairs and motions are conducted in accordance with the decree and will of the Creator may be exalted. In other words, when they do something, the very first thing they find out is, is this the way of God? Is this His will? Exactly. How do I accomplish this? Right? I'm not going to do it unless I find out how to do it. i got to find out His will about this before I begin to do what? Before I begin to carry about or carry on doing what, whatever I want to do. So he says, Hence they cease preferring one situation to another, but trust that the Creator will from among all possible situations select for them what is best and most fitting. They realize he's concerned for them. He loves them. And he's going to tell them what is best for them and most fitting for them. So they just don't go out and say, oh, well, it's option number one, option number two, and I'll, I'll choose door number three. May not be the wrong door. Right? When they ascertain from the Torah that he enjoys us to fulfill religious precepts and to choose to serve him. Notice that. He doesn't demand that we serve him. The greatest thing that, that anyone should be able to stand up and praise God for is free will. We're not robots, even though sometimes we'd like to be. <laughs> it, it might seem to simplify things. But what reward would there be if we were just robots? 
God wants us to love Him because we choose to love Him. He wants us to obey Him because we choose to obey Him. But we have to learn. We have to learn what God, number one, has done for us so we can respond in kind. See how He responds to us. Respond to Him in kind. He loves us. We love Him. Right? Realizing that He desires the very best for us, we'll never do anything on our own from that point on. We have to make so many decisions in the daytime. Right? This is why it's so important that you study. So that you can make what? You make the proper decision. Not according to your ways and your thoughts. <laughs> your judgment, but according to His. And if we don't know His, how are we going to make the right decision? We're not going to do it. Choose to serve Him. That He discourages us, us from desiring physical delights and warns us against them. They exercise their free choice and consonance with His will. For in their hearts and inner selves they yearn for Him and long for His favor and they cease to long with heart and soul for this world and its attractions. I think as... And maybe as you get older, I, I think you can do this when you're young. You should be able to do this young. If you study enough when you're young, you can come to these same conclusions. Everything's just temporary. Except what you do. And some of those are only temporary. <laughs> but some of those you do will carry where? On the way into the next world. Now, he says, For in their hearts and inner selves they yearn for Him and long for His favor. You know, as, as the prayer that we, in Psalm, uh, that we say here, May God bless us. May God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause His face to shine upon us. Now, if you read that psalm, now number one, that's King David, and who's he, who's he praying about? What's this psalm about? Number one, he's saying this to the people of Israel. May God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause His face to shine upon us. Now, he's not saying this, by the way, to be uh, Hey, what word am I looking for? Uh, to be self-glorification for the nation of Israel. He's not saying, bless me, right? But may God be merciful unto us, Israel. May God bless us, Israel. And may God's face shine upon who? Upon Israel. He's not saying me, 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 me. He's saying no, this. he's saying Israel. Okay. But there's a reason. Not that they're going to receive all this benefit. Right? What's the reason? That thy ways may be known upon earth. That thy ways may be known upon earth. And thy saving health among Israel? All among all nations. Right? Let the people praise thee. Let who praise thee? Everybody. Everybody. Let all the people praise thee. And let the nations be glad. Why are we going? Why are we going to be glad for? For God will judge us, right? And govern us, and govern all the nations upon earth. Let the people what? Praise the O God. Why? Because it's not man that's in charge anymore. It's who? It's God. And then eventually he says, there comes a time when the earth will, will do what? Your forth its what? 
Truth. In it. Truth. Where's it going to come from? <laughs> and eventually all people do what? All people fear thee. That's the same thing, by the way, when Solomon's dedicating the temple in 1 Kings 8 and verse 41. A stranger. One that's not of Israel. Well, that's pretty clear. A gear, a stranger, one that's not of Israel. When he comes and he prays toward this place for thy name's sake, what's God supposed to do? Hear him. Answer him. Why? So that he will learn to fear Hashem just as Israel fears Hashem. When David is asking for God's blessing upon the people of Israel, it's not for a selfish motive. He wants people to stand back and look at Israel and say, gee, what's so different about these people? Why is God blessing upon them? And what will the nations begin to choose at that point? We want God ruling us. God rules Israel. And look what they're doing. Look how good they've got it. What do we want? The same. We want the same. Because we see the benefit that they have. They, God's merciful to them. He blesses them. He shows them His favor. What do we want? Same, same thing. Let the nations be glad. Let them rejoice. We want Him to govern us just like He governs Israel. Now that can get us into a situation, by the way. <laughs> because when God governs us just the way He governs Israel, you know, if you goof up, <laughs> a little bit stricter, right? So we have to be careful, but we want that. That's the thing we want. Because why? Because we see how God governs Israel how He blesses them, how He shows them favor, and we want the same providence of God in the lives of all the nations. Okay? So He goes on to say, they hope that He will help and strengthen them to achieve their aspirations in His service and to fulfill what they had chosen of His commandments. For what they are able to put into practice, they offer praise and thanksgiving to God. And he commends them for their efforts and chosen course. <clears throat> for what they are unable to realize of their aspirations because they lack the strength to achieve it, they apologize before God and resolve to execute it. I goofed up, God. Didn't do it exactly the way you want me to do it. I got it wrong. But I'm resolving from this point on to do what? To get it right. To get it right. And I want to keep trying to do what? Do I do get it right? They apologize to God and resolve to execute it when they will be able. They long for the time when this will come possible. The nations, by the way, should be longing for the time that God rules over them. They're not. They want to rule themselves. They don't want God's rule. Because they think God's rules are very what? Strict. Strict. Rough. Defining. Defining. Confining. Confining. Restricted. Why? Because there's no love for them. There's no respect for them. And they don't see the benefit of those laws. Can't see it. Too limiting. Too limiting. There's a way, the book of Proverbs says, it seemeth right in the eyes of man. But the ends thereof is death. There's always that way. So they long for the time when this will become possible, and the Creator help and treat them in regard with purity and sincerity. This is their highest wish and their most cherished request of God, as David, peace be upon him, said, Would that my course be steady in keeping your statutes. Just keep me what? Keep me on track. Don't want me to get what? Don't let me get sidetracked. Just be steady. 
Now steady doesn't mean I'm doing what? I'm not running an MRA. Mm -hmm. I'm just what? Consistent. Consistent. Steady. You know, David says one of these songs, he says, if a righteous man stumbles, Would falls, he, be cast down? He, will not be cast he will not be utterly cast down, where God has him what? By the hand. By the hand. He'll get back up and what? Keep on Let's try it again. Right? You don't give up. Steady. A lot of people have this thing that I'm just giving up. This doesn't seem to work. You know, I've tried to serve God. It just doesn't work for me. That's a problem. You've been what? You've been working. You've been trying. <laughs> if you love God, do you have to try to serve Him? Somebody that you love, somebody that you really care for, do you ever have to really try to do anything for them? Nope. Does it feel like an effort to do anything for them? The ones you don't care about is the ones you have a hard time doing. The ones that you don't care about is the ones you have a hard time doing something for. But if you love somebody, it's effortless to do something for them. You just do it. If you don't care for them, boy, it puts a lot of Oh, struggle to do something for somebody. But if you love them, it's an effortless task. And you may not even remember it, but they will. Exactly. You know why? Because it's just the right thing to do. Because you love those individuals. You don't see it any other way. And it could not be done any other way. Just a natural thing. Just a natural thing to do. And if we love God, no task is too difficult. If we don't love Him, the task is very difficult. I think one of the biggest things that's missing sometimes within the Bene Noah movement is love of God. I mean, I've been around a lot of people and they think, it's almost like, you know, when we start talking about the love of God, it almost seems like the Christianity. You know, you've got to love God. You go, look, <laughs> The Torah teaches us that we should love God. King David expresses love of God. The Torah demands that we love God. He commands us that we love Him. And the thing about it is, if we really love Him, all these commandments, they're no longer commandments. If you really love Him, they're no longer commandments. You, you rush to do those things. But eventually you also understand He loved me so much that He wanted to benefit me and that's why He gave me those commandments. It's, it becomes effortless on our part to do something if we love somebody. And if we love God, it becomes effortless for us to serve Him. No effort. You don't see the service. You just do it. Just the way you are. Just the way you are. So don't think that this love of God is something that's uh, just preserved for the so-called New Testament. Love of God has been around ever since the Torah's been in existence. The love of God has been around ever since God's been in existence. And we have been in existence anyway. Huh? So he goes on to say, would that my course be steady in keeping your statutes. Just, just plot. Just keep on going. And love will keep you going. I remember being in the service, you know, and, 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 and you hear this from a lot of servicemen. A lot of times, you're not supposed to <laughs> carry pictures of your loved ones and your belongings on the battlefield. There's reasons why, but a lot of guys always snuck a picture. And even in the worst times of their lives sometimes, that picture is what kept them going. How many of y'all remember seeing uh, Black Hawk Down? Pretty, pretty vicious movie. <clears throat> One of the uh, helicopter pilots that was shot down. He kept a picture in his helmet. 
of his wife and child. And he's the one, by the way, that got captured alive, was eventually let go. They captured him alive, but he had his picture. He was looking at the last thing he was doing before they got him was he was looking at that picture. And in the movie, they show him beating him, and he's trying his best to hang on to that picture. They keep knocking it out of his hand. He keeps grabbing it back. You know why? That was his hope. That was his hope. That was what was going to what? Keep getting through. That was going to get him through. Still remember, have some little part of something that he what? That he loved. That he, loved, that he cherished. And that would help him get through this awful moment in his life. Near death. Near death. Unfortunately, he didn't die. I mean, he actually lives, but uh, uh, but just steady. You know? Just steady plotting. It's not the first runner that takes off and runs uh, with abandonment that wins the race. <laughs> you know who it is? Steady. steady. Just steady. That first runner that runs out there, you know, if you look in a lot of races, especially long distance races, you'll have people that are thrown into those races to do just one thing. Can't steady. Wear everybody else out. They'll take the lead. Set the pace. They'll set the pace. They know that they cannot run that whole race at that pace. But they will get out in front and they'll set the pace. Keeps everybody else kind on of their toes. Right? But they'll set the pace. But eventually, you know what? Nobody else will pass them. Nobody else will pass them. But eventually, they'll fall out. Very seldom, very seldom that somebody that sets the pace will ever finish the race. And when that person falls out, there'll be another person step up to set the pace. And if the pace is too slow, there's going to be a lot of people finish very closely. But if the pace, pace is fast, there's not going to be many people finish very close together. There's going to be those that just keep on steady with that pace. And finally, you got enough kick at the end, you can survive. But just being steady. So he says that the, the Creator comments, commends them, for their aspiration to serve Him, even if its actually fulfillment is withheld from them. What's He saying here? They, had, they didn't do it, but their heart was in it. The Creator commends them for their aspiration to serve Him, even if its actual fulfillment is withheld from them. In other words, they weren't able to do it. But they, but they tried. But they tried. As He said to David, this is God speaking today in Melachim. As for your intention to build a house for my name, you did well to have that intention. But what did David not do? He didn't get to build it. So God said what? Too much blood on What was God said about David though? I'm proud of you. I like that intention. It's good. 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 I, I just, I'm just proud of the fact that you have an intention, that you really have something, a real kavana, a real intention to do something for me. You want to serve me. I can't allow you to do it, but I appreciate the thought and the intent. And the intent. In their hearts and minds, they are removed from their secular concerns and the care of their bodies. Emerging in these with their physical senses alone, when the need or necessity arises, as these are unimportant and meaningless to them. You know why? Because if you're serving God, if you love God and you're serving Him, do you have to worry about a place to live? He'll provide it for you. Do you have to be concerned about food? Might not have steak, but steak may not be good for you. <laughs> yeah. And, and most of us I know sitting here like a good bowl of beans and onions anyway. <laughs> With a little cornbread. 
So, we're, I mean, we're, we can survive. We appreciate a good bowl of beans and uh, onions and some cornbread. Fried potatoes on the side. That's right, all those carbs. Well, you gotta have a little sin, I guess. <laughs> That's carbs. <laughs> But it says they turned their hearts and souls to their religious interests and to serving God, to honor and exalt Him, to keep His commandments. Their bodies are on earth, but their hearts are in heaven. With the knowledge of God in their minds, they serve Him as if they were the holy angels in the highest heaven. Selfish desires melt away from their hearts and craving for physical pleasures is uprooted from them. Because they are saturated with longing for God's service and with love for Him, the fire of the instinct is put out in their hearts. Its heat is cut off from their imaginations because of the power of the light of God's service which encloses it. Like what happens to a lamp in the light of the sun, they are humbled by all for God and confess their shortcomings before Him. They bow to His service and are oblivious to want. <laughs> Whoa, that was kind of hard, huh? Oblivious to want. Of course, we have that new word in our vocabulary in our generation, need. <laughs> but they're oblivious to want. You know, if you think about it, if you go all the way back to the garden when God first created man, He takes man, He places him in the garden. Right? What does He want? <laughs> Is there a need? Does he need shelter? Does he have to worry about shelter? Perfect environment. There's no mention of it. Perfect environment. He doesn't worry about shelter. God's took care of that for him, right? Worry about food? All around him. All around him. God's provided that. Everything that he needed was what? There. It was there. It was at his disposal. He could freely eat of any tree other than that one tree. Freely eat. You want to gorge? Go gorge yourself. You like peaches? Eat all you want. Apples? Eat all you want. Figs? Eat all you want. But that one over there? Can't eat that one. And guess what? The moment psychologically that somebody says we can't do that that's what we want to do. That becomes that temptation. We may not want to do it right now, but we'll start thinking. But we'll, we'll start thinking about it. At least the thoughts there. And then eventually say, well, why not? Why not? Exactly. Uh, is this going to kill me? <laughs> nah. Nah. That's what a lot of people said right before they died. Yeah. Hey, watch this. <laughs> But if we really come before God, if we really get humble by all for God, first thing to do is we just find fault in ourselves. We're look, God, you know us. <laughs> you know. I'm giving it my best shot, but when you tell God you're giving it your best shot, you better you better be sure you're getting it your best shot. <laughs> right? Don't try to lie to him. If you're giving it your best shot and you're still coming up a little bit short, just tell him that. Because sooner or later, you know what's going to happen? He's going to step in and give you a little help. Because he won't just let you keep failing. If you're giving it all that you've got, he'll eventually give you a little boost. Then he says, you will discover that they are exceedingly modest in their dealings with people. And speaking with people, they are wise. When questioned, they are knowledgeable. And when wronged, they are forbearing. I'll get you for getting me. You just wait. Your you just coming. wait. Your turn's coming. You know, I'll never forget what you did to me. <laughs> exactly. 
But when wrong, they are forbearing. If you could glimpse into their hearts, you will find hearts broken before God, full of His words and empty of worldly dealings. Love of God fills their hearts, hence they do not hunger for the words of the creatures to find no pleasure in their idle conversations. Spurning the way of destruction, they walk in the choicest path. I would suggest that you read Psalm 1. And by the way, some have said, some of the sages say this is actually a psalm about Noah. What does it say about a, a righteous man? Where does he not walk? In the counsel of the wicked. In the counsel of the wicked. Half of the unrighteous. He doesn't I'm not walking that way. Bad trail. Bad trail. Bad mojo. <laughs> <laughs> not going that way. Why? Because he knows the end of that trail. So he destruction. You know, we can say it many different ways. Destruction, death, uh, confusion, darkness. Just never leads anywhere. We're following the trail, but it doesn't go anywhere. You ever been in one of those? Just go around in circles. You know, you see the big corn mazes sometimes, there's only one way out. <laughs> and everybody else is going where? Around in circles. Around circles or running into those dead ends. You know, they think, well, I'm on one more way out. Boom, 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 boom. And all of a sudden they hit what? A dead end. Then they got to do what? Back up and start all over again. So he says, in Psalm 1, they do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. In their merit, he says, tribulations despair, and the rain falls. Elijah prayed one time, it didn't rain for how many years? Three. And then he prayed one. And it rained. Rain falls. Tribulation disappears. And rain begins to what? Fall. I think what we don't realize is when he says rain falls, and, and, and we can appreciate this more in the last few years, by the way, rain is such a blessing. Isn't it? Rain is such a blessing. And we get to the point, sometimes we take it for what? Take it for, for granted. granted. Sometimes we know that it is not for granted. Exactly. <coughs> and sometimes, oh, man, I wish this brain would get over with, you know. i got things i got to do, i got to do this, got to do that. And then somewhere down the road, well, I wish we had that rain now that I was complaining, complaining about. about. You know? yes. <laughs> but he says, in their marriage, tribulation, despair, and the rain falls. Blessings from God. Because remember there's two types of rain. One is the type of rain that just comes from natural rain. Right? It's a natural law that God set in the motion. But there's another type of rain that only comes what? When God, when we pray for rain. When we pray for rain. When we pray for rain. So he says, in their merit, man and earth are refreshed. Refreshed. Man and earth. For they abstain from forbidden things, forego all kinds of delicacies. You know, why can't I have a good cheeseburger? I'm talking from a Jewish perspective. Milk and meat. Why can't I just have a good cheeseburger? Well, that sounds sounds so good. Why can't I have a good cheeseburger? That just seems ridiculous, you know, because in the Torah it just says, "Thou shalt not see the kid in this mother's milk." Well, if I know this cheese didn't come from this mother, then I could put it on this kid. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> Cause I want what? I want a good cheeseburger. Why can't I put a piece of cheese on fish? Fish don't have milk. No. Because of what it looks like. Why can't I put fish on a piece of chicken or turkey? They don't have milk. Because of what people would receive it as. 
There's no prohibition against that. There's rabbinic prohibition, but there's not a core prohibition. Because people to perceive. Exactly. They don't want people to perceive that they're eating cheese with milk. But a lot of people get really being out of shape. You know, it's like, well, the rabbis say this is a separation of cheese and meat. That, you know, you can't eat, if you eat a, a cheese, a, a dairy product, you have to wait a certain length of time before you can eat a meat product. So they raise their mouth out and see some of them do. With dairy, by the way, you don't have to wait as long. You can eat dairy product, rinse your mouth out with water, and proceed to eat meat. For in some cases, that's some tradition. But with meat, once you eat meat, sometimes you have to wait four to six hours, or some will even say longer than that before you eat a dairy product. Oh man, this is just too much. This is just nonsense. Why can't I just have a good cheeseburger? <laughs> it's because you don't understand it doesn't mean it's not right. Thank you. Just because I don't always understand it doesn't mean that that's the way it is. The other thing is that they want to argue with some of the greatest sages and minds on the face of the earth that says this is what that text meant. And they were the ones that were the closest to it. <coughs> It's always funny to me that people that have grown up in America speaking English, right, learn a little Hebrew, and they become the instantaneous Hebrew scholars of the world. And wiser than the wisest. Exactly, oy vey. <laughs> Uh, it always amazes me that they become the arbitrarily interpreters of Torah. Authority. They become the authority. You know why? Because they want a good cheeseburger. <laughs> okay. But, as he goes on, by the way, rain falls in their marriage, the earth's refreshed, for they abstain from forbidden things. They don't do that. And you know what? They don't have any problem doing it. And I don't care if a rabbi said it, right? A great sage said, this is the way we understand it. This is the way we're going to observe it. And you think, okay, that's the way it is. You should never ask the rabbi if you're not going to follow it. Well, I mean, it's already stated. That's the law. So I'm going to follow that. Because I figure, number one, he's what? He's a lot smarter than me. These are judicial rulings that's been handed down for generations after generations. He's much closer to the source of truth than I ever have been. And, and if I don't have a cheeseburger, is it going to kill me? No. <laughs> Am I going to die? Not if you have something else. No, I've had something else. Uh, so he says... That they abstain from what? From forbidden things. They forego all kinds of delicacies and they draw back from prohibitions. Following the good and upright path, they reach majestic heights by enduring patiently for a short time. Thus they gain both worlds, collecting and perfecting the good and the excellent in both, as it says in the Psalms, beginning is the man who fears God. If you respect God, the obvious outcome is what? Now, rephrase it. Do what now? If you fear God, as he says here, what is the obvious? Obedience. That's what he says. Happy is the man who does what? Fears God. So if you fear God, you're automatically what? Happy. Does that mean everything goes okay all the time? Now, do you have to be happy to fear Him, or do you have to fear Him to be happy? A little bit of both. <laughs> but in this point, this text actually tells us that you're happy because you do, because you do fear Him. 
That's in uh, Tehillim 112. And then he says, How remarkable it is about them that the mitzvot that the creators commanded them to observe seem so few to them. I must say, 613? Huh? He should have got. Should have gave us more. Compared to what they owe him. He says, they, then they compared to what they owe him for his favors and compared to what they accept upon themselves in the way of effort and exert, exertion, forbearance and patience in order to adhere to his service. And he says, allow me to explain. And we're going to stop right there. You can read the explanation for next week <laughs> if you choose to. But uh, we're not going to get into it to next week. But he's going to give us an explanation of why these people live this way, right? And why they look at the commandments as being so few in number, as opposed to a lot of people saying, look at all these laws we got. And we've got to keep up with what? Keep up with all of them? And the other guy says, oh, there's so few. <laughs> right? Because, number one, he understands how much he does what? How much he owes God. And the commandments that he has are not numerous, they're just a few compared to how much he owes. Okay? So any questions or comments on what we've gone with so far? If no questions or comments, then God willing, we'll pick up right here next week on page 883 as we continue our study in Duties of the Heart by Rabbi Fox.